I have the very happy honor of introducing Father Tom Gaunt this morning. Father Tom is the Executive Director of the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate. Prior to coming to CARA, prior to coming to CARA in 2011, Father Gaunt served in the Jesuit governments as Associate Executive Secretary for the Jesuit Conference USA for nine years and the Formation and Studies Director of the Maryland and New York Jesuit Province for seven years. After ordination, he spent 10 years as a pastor and as the Director of Planning and Research in the Diocese of Charlotte. So we are very thrilled, and also Father Tom is a very good friend of Larsh, I'm not sure who yes. it is. So we've known each other in many different contexts, so we are so thrilled to have Father Tom with us here this morning. Father? Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I, I would say my first contact in the area of disability ministries was actually when I was a student at Gonzaga High School. And I was one of the summer volunteers in the first Shriver camps that Eunice Kennedy Shriver had at her home uh, in Rockville. So as a young man, I uh, had worked with uh, the Shriver camps and also with the DC government on summer programs for uh, children from Forest Haven. So it dates me a little when I go back that far. Um, but uh, it's a delight to be invited here today to uh, uh, speak to some of the research we've been doing on the topic and issues of disabilities in the church. A lot of this began a couple of years ago when I was uh, approached by Mary O'Mara from the Archdiocese, Jan Benton from the NCPD, uh, Steve Riley from Potomac Community Resources and Monsignor Insler from Catholic Charities. And they came to Kara and said, could you do some research for us in terms of how parishes, dioceses, Catholic Charities are engaging and including individuals with disabilities in their ministries and in their life? So we began the conversations there and developed a two-part study. The first part was done on the parishes, uh, and the second part on dio diocesan offices and Catholic Charities agencies across the country. These are both national studies. So we did first the parishes, then the diocese, Catholic Charities. This morning, I think it might be a little more effective and make a little more of the logic if we reverse order that. So I want to start with looking at the diocese and Catholic Charities and then move to the parish level. When we began this, <coughs> the, the big question was, what is being offered uh, through Catholic Charities and diocesan offices for people with disabilities? And what are some of the needs that they have? A very simple and basic question, and yet on a national level, we've never looked at this as a church. So when we sent out the surveys to every diocese in the United States and to every Catholic Charities agency, we got a very good response. So diocesan offices, dioceses, over 70% responded, and among Catholic Charities agencies, 80% completed the survey and responded to us. And so the first part is just looking in terms of what are some of the services or programs that diocese Catholic Charities offer. Now throughout this piece, what we have to keep in mind is it's not always a clear line or division between a diocesan offering and a Catholic Charities offering. Some dioceses have decided that Catholic Charities will be the home and center for everything related to disabilities. Uh, others have clear, clear distinctions. So there's an overlap constantly. But when we looked at just what does your organization offer in these services or programs, what we find here is, you know, under mental illness, Catholic Charities comes up high. 
under uh, serving individuals with intellectual disabilities, the dioceses come up much higher. And so you see this variation. Now some of it with the variation is key because Catholic Charities is offering functioning so direct social services and counseling services. Dioceses are offering more in terms of education, uh, in terms of catechesis, uh, some other related services that way. So you'll find a division here, and it doesn't mean that one is ignoring the other. It's saying one is acknowledging the other's taking care of it fine. They don't need to duplicate that service. But as you can see, the biggest part on mental illness or dealing with uh, intellectual disabilities, sensory disabilities, it starts declining as you go along this list. So those are the highest uh, number of programs on this area. At the far end, dealing with uh, veterans with war-related injury illness or chronic illness are, are the areas that have the, the smaller response or programs that are being offered. Did that switch? No. Nope, it did. Another graph. So in terms of this is looking at any services or programs offered. And so we looked at specific programs. So we have areas pro-life advocacy. Again, we find the diocese is heavily involved here in these programs. Catholic Charities a little less so. Again, it's the nature of the organization, what they're offering in their specialties. Family, parent support, uh, you can go down and see the, the changes. Counseling services, Catholic Charities, uh, most of them offer that. Uh, catechetical programs, again, that is found primarily in dioceses. But we can see again the changes and sort of the uh, gradual diminishment so that only about half of the diocese Catholic Charities end up offering something in terms of direct pastoral services uh, or disability advocacy that's going on. And then here we're asking that does the, the work of the diocese or the work of Catholic Charities work with any other Catholic organizations to serve people with disabilities? So we find here on that first column that dioceses are the ones who are going to be out engaging uh, others, either other Catholic organizations or other non-Catholic organizations. And again, if you start to think about the structures, it, it sort of makes sense that diocesan offices would be doing that Catholic Charities is again looking usually to very specific services that are being provided. When we ask about areas on addictions, we, we find again Catholic Charities would be higher on this, diocese much less so. And then in terms of sponsoring conferences and training uh, for uh, volunteers or employees, or for doing the same with families, uh, the diocese are offering much more of that. So here we are today, evidence of that. Uh, in terms of the diocese offering conferences and trainings, much less so than Catholic Charities. <coughs> and then towards the bottom of the list, when we ask them, does the diocese Catholic Charities offer support groups, programs for people with disabilities or with family members, uh, it comes down at the lower end. Catholic Charities is doing some of this a little more by the diocese but this tends to start to disappear. Fewer and fewer are doing this. So something like the Potomac Community Resources and those linkages, I think are rather unique here for the Archdiocese of Washington and the area. When we're looking at the departments, and so asking is there a specific department or office that's in charge of services for people with disabilities, uh, we find dioceses are much more likely to have that, but again, only about 38%. And then asking if they have a department or services uh, <coughs> for deaf ministry, again, dioceses, uh, about half dioceses say they do. So in terms of the specific you know, agency or grouping or someone designated to deal with disabilities, dioceses are much more likely than Catholic charities to have someone in that role. And then the services that are offered, we ask just in terms of language, and it's a, just a quick item. What's interesting here, uh, English and Spanish, so we'd expect that to be dominant in terms of the services offered. It's interesting here that when we're 
looking at uh, diocese, 40% offer services uh, in American Sign Language. And then the, the numbers go down with other groups. And we asked in terms of Catholic Charities agencies, again, English and Spanish are very large. The third one was American Sign Language. Uh, and then the Catholic Charities actually offering a larger number in a variety of other languages. But again, that would kind of make sense to the services they're offering. We look at a question about evangelization. And this is really kind of more of a sense about reaching out to others. And so what we're asking, is there information on the diocesan website about program services offered for people with disabilities? 57% of the diocese said yes. We asked, is there contact information about these programs? 61% said yes. When we asked if the website, though, was designed to be accessible uh, to blind and deaf parishioners, uh, it would drop down to 8%. And then, again, when we're asking about there, is there information on the diocesan newspaper, is there content in the diocesan, it goes back up. The anomaly here is simply that making that information accessible to someone who is either blind or deaf uh, is few and far between, to say the least. And that's in terms of diocese. When we move to Catholic Charities, again, we find almost the same thing. So they're providing some information, they're making it available, but is the website itself or some of those tools, is that accessible again to those uh, with visual difficulties or the deaf? And again, there's very few have that availability. And towards the end of the survey, we, we asked uh, with the diocese and Catholic Charities kind of an open-ended question. And so we're asking, what are the resources that you need? And diocese came back and said, first part would be training. The second, a dedicated staff focused on this area of disabilities. And then catechetical ministry, visual deaf ministry needs, uh, family, caregiver support, financial resources, accessibility. And as we went through this, and we'll see in the parish study, the piece of accessibility is down towards the bottom. When we start surveying parishes, uh, it, it's becoming not quite universal, but much more uh, close to it, that uh, access into the church itself. We find great differences when we ask about access to the sanctuary. We find great differences to say, and is there an accessible bathroom? You know, and things that kind of link up, saying, well, do you really expect parishioners to stay and join in to think together if there's no access to a bathroom? Uh, so, but the top piece for resources needed, training, dedicated staff, kind of come down. Then we asked Isis, what's the best resource or ministry that you're offering? And 40% said it's catechetical ministerial programs. So it's interesting to see 20% are saying this is a, a needed area that they have need for, 40% also say that this is the best thing they're offering. They're doing this very well. The same here on visual deaf ministry. You get 16% said they need more resources. 33, a third diocese, say, no, they're doing this very well. It's their best thing. And then the third part is this recreational family support programs, the need there. Again, a notable number say they're, a notable number say they're doing well. There's also a good number saying they have a great need. And then on the school issue. So the, the mix is we have across the country in the whole nation, we have dioceses who are doing these different areas very well. And we can have next door to them or the next state over dioceses that are really struggling and say we have little or nothing here available. And we looked at the Catholic Charity Agencies now understand there's a Catholic charity agency for every diocese in the country. So there are 178 Catholic charity agencies. And we're asking them the same things. A uh, different question, what resources programs would you provide if unlimited resources were at your disposal? So they come back, mental health, substance abuse, the Catholic charities. They see that as kind of the greatest need if they had an unlimited budget. Family assistance, respite care, accessibility, 
housing programs, recreational staff case workers, hearing visual assistance, employment training. And then when we asked them, what's the best thing that you currently offer? What's the program that you're most proud of? They'll talk about the case management assistance, and they'll speak of mental health counseling and support employment services and respite care training. So when we put this in the blue, black, or red, it's kind of highlight these are Catholic charity agencies saying, this is a great need. We have a long way to go in this. But also we find that some of the agencies are saying, and this is the best thing we do. Uh, and we have excellent programs. So it's this part that what we do best and what we find needs for, you know, uh, again, diocese by diocese, Catholic charities by Catholic charities can vary quite widely across the board. Any questions on this first part? Try to explain some of the resources. Yes. Did you limit the number of things that people could check when or what they would provide? No, this was open in. This was their answer. So it's just a blank box. Okay. And they could put one, they could put 20. And some put 20. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you work in survey research, uh, you know, you get a little box. Yeah. You really mean for people just to use that box. <laughs> because we'll get back essays, you know, that folks will put in here. We have to transcribe and kind of you try and analyze it as best we can. But at, at that point, you're saying, you know, we really only needed 20 words, uh, not 200. But so it was open-ended. So we've got this whole litany of items that came in uh, across the board. Well, as I thought about, you know, these, this, it seems like this is the organization's reaching outward. Yeah. Any information about what they actually do internally? We asked, and I had to pick and choose on all the slides, in the reports, and we have copies of the reports here. There's a big, huge report that you can get through Mary uh, and others. Uh, but what we found, and I'll touch on the parish in, is uh, we don't know if the chicken and egg piece. Do people pay more attention, therefore make things more accessible? therefore inviting in as volunteers, employees, and ministers, people into the staff and leadership. So which comes first? Or did they happen in the staff and leadership to have someone with a disability who started kind of making people more aware and conscious? So we see this cycle that goes on. But those, both the Catholic Charities, dioceses, parishes, it is if there is someone there in leadership or a visible role, starts to change everything else. It was hand in hand. So again, we don't know which came first on it, uh, but it's a clear point of kind of visibility and access leadership. Yes? Um, was there any way to sort of determine when people said they had programming in a particular area, whether they meant they had a special program for people with disabilities, or they had supports to make the programs that they had for everybody accessible to people with disabilities? That was, wouldn't always be clear. So a lot of these were kind of forced choice. We gave them, you know, like five, six items. And that is, it, it's, uh, you're not sure. It takes more investigation to go into. Uh, because I'm sure on one level you have agencies or dioceses, we have a, a, a handicap accessible ramp. We've done our job. And that's it. Uh, to, to, you know, more engagement. Right, or we have, you know, special needs CCD versus we have support so that kids can access CCD in their community. Yes. And, and again, I'll touch on, we got a lot richer data actually from the parishes. Because that's kind of on the ground. And again, what was so impressive when again, the parish side of the study it is you're reading these surveys and other data you collect and you just see the ingenuity and creativity and the resourcefulness of local parishes, particularly in urban area, in, uh, sub, in rural areas, where it'd be a small parish with limited resources, access to items, and it's honestly, you know, behind the survey, you can just picture there's the pastor there, there's a the DRE there, and they're kind of scratching their set head and saying, we have to find a way to include everybody, period. And we don't have any money, we don't have, a, you know, can't tap into all these other resources. And they're just ingenious, you know, in, in how they try to resolve this in so many different levels. So let me switch to, to the 
parish side of the survey, which I think you may find uh, a little more uh, engaging. We sent this uh, out to uh, a selection of around 4,000 uh, parishes across the United States. So it's all randomized, stratified, sampled. We got back well over 800 completed surveys from parishes. So for us, in, as social scientists, we were happy with this. And our concern is in terms of the measuring the margin of error. And so in the sample size and the response we got back, the margin on this was just over 3%. So the academic standard is 4%. What you read in the newspaper often is whatever makes a good headline. <laughs> you go down and read the fine print, you'll find that these surveys are, have wide margins of error. But for, on the academic standard, it's generally about 4%. You want to do that or, or better. So this was better than 4%. And so we asked the, the parishes to identify what you know, area or location of their parish we found that about a quarter were urban city parishes, 36% uh, over a third were suburban parishes, and 39% were rural. And with this, this would somewhat, we got a few more responses really from the rural side, and a, and a, few, and a few less from the suburban side on that end. But it was fairly well balanced across the country. And uh, we started off the question asking simply are, are you aware of any parishioners with the following disabilities? Just asking it, or are there members of your parish? Here, so aging related was pretty much universal. Chronic illness, uh, physical disabilities. And then, you know, once you get below the 90%, then it's saying mental illness, intellectual disabilities, sensory disabilities, autism, veterans with war related injuries, illness. So the, the piece of re, the pastors or the pastoral minister responding is kind of aware that there are parishioners on this whole spectrum of disabilities. Now there are many more that we could kind of put in here, but you had a, a limit to how many you can get into one question at a time. But the, so there is this awareness across the country. And then we're asking that if there was a parish-based school so th this is maybe half or so of the, of the schools and parishes in the country. Half of the schools might be parish-based. The other half are more regional, diocesan-based. So this only applies to a smaller subset that the parish could be answering these questions. And so when we're asking, does the school include children with disabilities? And we see 83% said yes. And do they uh, have support staff to help these students? 75% said yes. Does a school make accommodations for parents with disabilities? 71% saying yes. And here's what's really intriguing. Does the school budget include salaries or resources related to accommodating children with disabilities? 57% say yes. Now some of that often, depending on what state you, you live in, that can be direct state money that can be readily, more readily had in terms for disability services or support services. But what's intriguing here, when it goes to the 57%, we could, the temptation is to look at this and say, well, they're not doing enough, which I think is, is, is erroneous. I think this is one of these points of, no, no, no. What we have is 83% of the schools are including children with disabilities, and there's a 26% difference here between whether they're getting any money for it. And this is back to the part of parishes saying, no, no, we're not going to exclude or say we can't have this child come to our school. We'll find a way to make it work. And as you dig into this, these become kind of the interesting stories of what happens here. So a lot of it is the effort on the part of the, par the parish schools and the parishes, again and again, uh, uh, of the, the instinct or desire is, is inclusion. But they may not have the resources or funds behind it. But that doesn't mean they're just going to say no. They're going to try and find a way. And so then when we're asking about the parishioners' participation in the parish, here we're asking, you know, does the parish offer accommodations to include those with disabilities in sacramental preparation 
uh, catechesis. 87% said somewhat or very much. 63% said very much, the highest level. So we see the, the parishes, there is a, a, a strong kind of across the board effort in that area. Are there parishioners with disabilities who regularly participate in social activities? 83% that somewhat, very much, or very much. 39% saying very much. So we see a decline in terms of participating in the social activities of the parish on that very much. Does the parish offer accommodations uh, for, for people with disabilities for marriage preparation? Again, about two thirds saying yet, yes, they are doing that. Less so in the sense of uh, very much so. Are there parishioners with disabilities who regularly participate in adult formation? Now we get down to about just over half saying yes. And then it'll be yellowed, and I should have yellowed this bottom one too. Are there parishioners with disabilities who regularly serve in ministry roles? 53%, but then we get over to the very much, it's less than one in five, 19%. Are parishioners with disabilities members of parish communities, uh, committees? We get just under half, and again on the very much so is the 18%. So what we find is in the provision of some services, you know, or assistance level, parishes are, 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 I would say, are quick to respond or trying hard to respond that way. In the areas of inviting or eliciting both the people with disabilities to be ministers, to be volunteers, to be staff members, we start to find something different. And so on a larger scale with the parishes, we pretty much, again, have across the board an effort to be inclusive, at, at least to, to bring in people coming to church. We don't quite see that same level in terms of being inclusive when we think of the ministries in the parish, the volunteer opportunities, the leadership opportunities within the parish itself. And so when we asked here about people with disabilities who work in the parish, are there volunteers with a disability at the parish? 72% said yes. Are there ministers with disability at this parish? 40, down to 48%. And are there staff members with disabilities? Down to 17%. And, and so you just kind of have this dropping down very quickly on this piece. And again, this is a national study. So we get 800 representative parishes answering from all different backgrounds. Then we ask in terms of the uh, training. So are you aware of opportunities, you know, for parish staff to, to access training like this? 49, half the parishes said yes, they are aware of that. Are you aware of opportunities with other organizations for training? It drops down some. And then do your staff volunteers at your parish actually participate? It drops down another block. So there, there is a piece. Yes, it would be great to be increasing the awareness on that, but recognizing there's quite a gap there between the awareness and actually then responding to it and acting on it. And so some of this, keep in mind, it is a question then of visibility and leadership. You know, if lectors, ushers, Eucharistic ministers, uh, people you know visiting uh, shut-ins, are also parishioners with disabilities, this creates a whole visibility uh, of this part of the parish community uh, that's often lacking. You know, as opposed to simply being a recipient of services, you are also a minister of the gospel. We're asking you questions about accommodations for sacraments, parish events. And so does the parish offer accommodations for parishioners with disability who participate in faith formation for adults. 83%, very good, saying somewhat always. Uh, does the parish have a way to include those with a gluten intolerance for communion? 80%, fairly uh, common. Does the parish offer accommodations to allow those with disabilities to participate in youth ministry? 78%, again, fairly common. Uh, and does the parish assist parishioners who cannot get to the parish uh, on their own without help with transportation, 62%. So again, this part of kind of 
providing the service or the access uh, is pretty strong and ingrained in the parish life. You know, it's more unusual not to find at least some effort in these areas. And then we're asking in terms of the educational accommodation that the parish uses for children and youth with disabilities. And so we, we had a whole string of items asking, do you use this for catechetical areas, for religious education, for youth group items? One-to-one -one instruction, one-to-one -one aid are fairly common. Modified curriculum, small group learning, preferential seating, team teaching, peer tutoring. So you'll see this. Uh, what's interesting, when we asked the question, again, the highest level was at 47%. So I'm not sure, because they say the young people or the kids are being included, but we don't necessarily, we're not sure. Are there other things we're missing? Or is they're really not that included or assisted? And then asking here again, does the parish offer uh, resources for people with disabilities, you know, references? About half say they do. Do they have uh, assisted listening devices? Just over a third. Support group for people with disabilities? You know, it's, it's, it's trying to get kind of rare. And the same with support groups for families. So again, the the listing and references and some of the listening devices are available. The support group piece of it drops down. When we get a larger grouping, though keep in mind this is representing the whole nation, so we have about a third of parishes that are smaller, more rural parishes. So the support group would well, be a two to one. They're so small, how would you form the group? But also, they're so small, there is naturally a support group. I mean, so you have it kind of going both ways in a small parish. And then we have these open-ended questions asking them, uh, you know, what resources from the diocese would be helpful? And so the, the number one, educational support training programs. Boom, what we're here doing today. This, people kept saying this would be most helpful. Interestingly, the second one was financial support, 14%. And then we got others that just, you know, were all over the lot. The parish's best resources, so what are you doing well? What you're proud of? Physical accessibility, acceptance inclusion, visual hearing assistance, religious education, faith formation are the dominant items that were named. And then the same, what additional resources are needed that come back to the, uh, for the parish to provide more kind of on audiovisual items, physical accessibility, group support training. Again, when we're asking about the uh, physical accessibility, it's almost universal that you can get into a parish, a church, uh, by a handicap ramp, ramp or other uh, means. Uh, some of those can be a little more challenging than others uh, and difficult to utilize. Again, the big piece is can people get in the sanctuary? Can people get into the sacristy? Is there a bathroom that is accessible? Is the parish hall accessible? You know, so there's a litany of items there that also kind of follow on that. You know, are the parish offices accessible? So it's not unusual, you can get into the church, but you can't use the bathroom, you can't go have a cup of coffee, and you can't meet with the pastor in the uh, uh, parish offices. So these are the various challenges that come up. But access to the church itself is pretty much universal. It's the other facilities where there's great need. And again, when we asked on this, what you see, you saw was a clear link for a number of parishes saying that was, the, it was just the financial cost of how to, to make other parts of the facility uh, accessible. And again, this varies widely depending where you are and the size of your parish. If you're in a big suburban parish, you have lots of resources. If you're in a smaller urban parish, the likelihood that the church was built with a multitude of steps, you know, 100 years ago, that you're trying to uh, negotiate, or if you're in a small rural parish where there's just very limited resources. So very different challenges around the country. 
And the parishes part, we asked also on this question about evangelization or outreach, and looking in particular to the parish uh, bulletin or newsletter. So everybody has a parish bulletin and newsletter. Is there information in there uh, about opportunities offered for parishioners with disabilities? Only about 40% say they have that. Most parishes have a parish website. On the website, is there information uh, for people with disabilities? You know, again, smaller number, is the website accessible to those with visual uh, or deaf uh, parishioners? And again, that goes, drops down to almost none. So there's a piece here that, in terms of the median of communication, we still end up kind of leaving out one group of the parish. So when we began this survey, these set of surveys, and we started with the parish survey, uh, the idea was we wanted to look at the participation of people with disabilities in parish activities. We wanted to look at the resources parishes use to teach children with disabilities, how the parish includes people with disabilities into the sacraments, you know, through catechetical means, and then how parish facilities are constructed to accommodate people with disabilities. So these are the four areas the survey uh, was designed to try and measure. And so after examining all these, we've gone through a lot of the data uh, and looking at the whole country, we, we find a couple of interesting takeaway points. One was, and this is kind of a bit of a puzzle, so you know you can, part of it in, in the survey piece, when you get the data, you try and figure out what's the theory or explanation behind it. Parishes in the Northeast are more likely than anywhere else in the United States to evangelize to people with disabilities. And, and, and to have a little more program, a little more accessibility down the line. The logic of that doesn't always quite fit. The oldest church facilities are in the Northeast. You know, the newest are in the South and the West. And much of what's in the South and West built since ADA, you know, and with a very conscious effort of inclusion and access. Uh, but we found, again, parishes in the Northeast. Now, there is one piece to it. Um, and uh, Cardinal Worrell, when he was Bishop of Pittsburgh, made disabilities a focus in Pittsburgh. Cardinal Worrell, when he came to Washington, made disabilities a particular focus here. Uh, you all may know, or Barry may know, you know that there, some of this may just be a bit of chance, in the sense that there are a couple of bishops or other church leaders in the Northeast that have kind of gotten on the bandwagon and said, we're going to make a difference here, we're going to change things. And maybe that accounts for it. But we're, we are generally puzzled because we can't quite figure out the theoretical explanation of why the Northeast. We expected the South and West, but that's not what we found. The second piece, if a parish has someone with a disability on their parish committee or councils, they are more likely to evangelize people with disabilities. And the third one, having a staff member with a disability and if a parish has done renovations to accommodate people with disabilities, it is also key. And this is uh, the, the part in talking with Steve Riley from Potomac Community Resources, when we're discussing the initial results together, he kind of coined this point of kind of, it's a, a cycle of virtue. And so you, you have kind of an attention on greater access and as you have greater access, there's kind of more inclusion of people, at least initially physically inclusion. Uh, and with the greater inclusion, you start to get more participation and engagement in a variety of activities. With that greater participation and activity, you tend to move the circle around to more people with disabilities in leadership roles, ministerial roles, which also tend then to lead to more attention to access. You know, and you can almost see this circle, you know, on just a, a simple example. Uh, you know, if you build a, a ramp for, for an old church, you know, and the pastor and others are suddenly surprised because, you know, the two people in wheelchairs and walkers are here and you're happy, and you thought that you were doing it for them, but then you find out that the 
older parishioners, you suddenly have a lot more at Mass because they're coming every single Sunday as opposed to the Sundays when they were really feeling good and were going to navigate those steps. Uh, and you start to realize how much those steps kept out people who could navigate the steps, but it was just a little more arduous. As they, you know, and you just find this step by step by step by step in, in this circle. And this is one of these pieces. We're not sure exactly, you know, where it starts. You know, we could start saying we're going to do a ramp. But why are you doing the ramp? And you're doing the ramp because you have somebody on your parish council, elected to your parish council, you know, uh, who has a mobility difficulty, and she kind of lets you know how difficult it is, and you're just like, oh, well, we got to do this. So we find this kind of cycle of virtue. It's like, I think Steve kind of captured it well. And it, it, it's one of the takeaways from it is that probably from our survey data, the, the most important things that we can do are likely to cost us nothing. And that is simply the point of inclusion. And so we found in parishes or, or in the agencies where someone was designated saying, you're going to be responsible for questions about disability. It doesn't have to be a new office, it doesn't have to be a new hire, just somebody to pay attention to this, who starts to bring up what are the obstacles. And a number of these obstacles are not necessarily things that cost money. Facility, you know, revamping costs a lot of money on that part. But again, we did a study with the NCPD a number of years ago about uh, the uh, catechetical services with parishioners with autism. And I, well, and Mary's heard me talk about this, I was fascinated with the data that came in. And what fascinated me was not what Our Lady of Mercy Parish in Potomac, you know, who had lots of resources, what they were doing. What was fascinating was Our Lady of Mercy Parish in Grand Island, Nebraska, you know, who sat here and said, we have two children with autism. We don't know how to include them. I'm going to go down to my neighbor who's a special ed teacher. And she, who's a good Baptist, is going to come over and help us figure out how to do First Communion. You know, and we're getting kind of these types of accounts. And so what we found with it was there is a piece here of, of financial resources at play. But it also became very clear that it was simply that point of making parishioners with disabilities, in a sense, visible to the parish. And the parish begins to respond. You know, the, the natural instinct of this parish community is not to exclude. But, but if it's not visible, they're, they're, they're not conscious. So this was kind of the, the key kind of takeaway. It is probably the one thing that every pastor, every parish could do is kind of this active way of how does a parishioner with a disability become a visible leader or minister within the community itself. And if you do that, start to let it just unfold. So our thanks again to all the groups who sponsored this research. So it was from, again, Potomac Community Resources, Catholic Charities, uh, with the Archdiocese, and with the NCPD. We have, I have just a couple copies of the two special reports on the research itself available here. You can go to the websites uh, of each of the groups and, and download a copy if you'd like it. If you're really desperate and can't fall asleep at night, we can send you a copy, or Mary can, of the full reports. Each one are about 100 pages or more. And it will give you more details and numbers than you ever wanted to look at uh, on this and kind of the breakdown uh, in parishes and dioceses and Catholic charities. Questions? Yes. Um, I want to, so these, uh, the, your survey was in effect self reports. Yes. Yeah. As um, all surveys are. Yeah. Um, is there is any research being done on the like, like parish will say, yes, we offer the services, but are those in fact the services that the parishioners need? Father Tom, uh, could you repeat the question just for oh, a Oh, okay. So, uh, are, are the questions in terms of asking parishes, 
when they say these are the services they offer, are they in fact the services that the parish needs? So in our research, no, we didn't get at that. So other than the question, the open-ended, saying what do you do best and what do you need? So we see some of the differences, but also where they overlap. But it's in a national study. <coughs> I'm assuming the parish who says we do catechesis very well is not the same parish saying this is what we need. So it's a different parish, uh, that one. But yes, there's often a, a disjunction. And again, I would say in my own experience in the area of disabilities, uh, the key for engagement and inclusion, it, it helps to clarify that very point. You know, again, a parish with all sincerity can believe that we have a handicap access ramp, we've done. You know, and, and realize that you, you haven't even started. And, and But it's the, that point of awareness that, that is key. And that's where we find this point in a, a cycle of virtue, that when you do get just one person and just uh, someone with some disability who's there in a visible role as a volunteer, a minister, a staff member, it just starts to change the whole parish. Excuse me, Father, would you mind just passing the microphone oh, to the question? Is it on? Yep. All okay. Set. Thank you. This was really fascinating. And I think the point you made, that's also what we find in the disability employment field, is one employee with disability makes a huge difference in the workplace. Um, so what are your next steps? What are our next steps? Our next steps is to the uh, asking Mary and Monsignor Insler and others, you know, the, what are the next steps and needs on disability research? At CARA, we do research for the church in America and we do whatever research we're asked to pursue. So the next steps are really up to uh, Mary O'Mara and Monsignor Insel. <laughs> Great answer. Was that our fault? <laughs> I'm wondering about. I was wondering about when you're talking about uh, uh, accessibility to people with disabilities, and then there. Uh, uh, participation in ministry, how would that compare with quote unquote normal people in the pews and then their participation in ministry? I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm asking is like you know, if you have a lot of people, a lot of parishes will accommodate folks with disabilities, and the number of ministry drops down quite a bit. Yes. And, and I'm wondering, does that just mirror what happens in you have all the people in the pews, and very few of them actually end up coming down to, to, to participate in ministries, or is it really that these parishes are not equipped to, to and or to, are not welcoming people in the ministries? Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Uh, so on the first part, you know, we do other larger scale surveys and studies, and about a quarter of Catholics come to Mass every Sunday. You know, and another quarter of Catholics come to Mass at least once a month. So half of the Catholics never show up, pretty much. But so the half that show up, when we get down and say, do you come to Sunday Mass and do you do one other thing in the parish? You know, whether it's being an usher or Boy Scouts or a men's group or whatever. We're down to 3% of the Catholic population. And so it's a tiny group in there. So there, there is a piece that, well, I mean, would we expect this to be any different from among Catholics with disabilities? Part of us would say not necessarily. But the other part is, it, it's kind of the awareness and the invitation. And again, my work, I've been working with Larsh for the last uh, 16 years here in Washington. And it's uh, particularly those individuals with intellectual disabilities has spent so much of their life being excluded and diminished. Uh, the, the transformation, you know, we see in large community members when they're at the parish and they're invited to help, to be an usher, to, to participate in different ways, uh, is incredible. So th there's a piece that, especially in that area that I'm familiar with, the, the need to reach out and be encouraging is, is key. Uh, and especially with a population who are so uh, marginalized uh, consistently. So for the pastor saying, yes, you know, 
Mary, I would like you, you to do the reading. You know, I would like you to be a Eucharistic minister, whatever. And, be and it's also on our own perceptions in the general population, which is, a, you know, on that level is relating disabilities with that people can't do. And much less an idea that someone with disabilities can serve me. Just one other thought. How about uh, the question of invitation to uh, families or to folks with disabilities? The point of view that you know, there's a sort of a self-isolating factor to that. And any thoughts on inviting those people to say, hey, there's a place for you here? Yes, yes. Uh, again, I think some of that comes in a very, I mean, there's a, you can, we can programmatically set up a way to do that. But I think the other key is making a conscious effort of how to get one or two people to be visible in the parish itself. Uh, we have one of the large community members at her parish in uh, Arlington. Uh, she's in a wheelchair and she's not very verbal but she has her place up there at the front pew. And this whole role that when Hazel's at Mass, uh, she greets everyone at communion. And the parish responds. Uh, and people visiting there are very touched and moved by this. And the pastor is encouraged, you know. It, and it just speaks volumes and how it changes attitudes. And again, uh, uh, inclusion, invitation. Other questions, comments? Yeah. I think the point that someone touched on earlier about whether parents even sort of know what the needs are is a really important one. Because I think sometimes when then people say, you know, in a variety of settings, well, we don't, we don't need to have interpreters because we don't have any deaf people in our community. And they don't think, you don't have any deaf people in your community because you don't have interpreters. Yes. Yeah. You know, so that sort of awareness of what the needs are, I think, is really critical. Yeah. And uh, there's a one area piece with the age-related disabilities, and this goes to the assistive li listening devices, a number of other items. And there it's simply, you know, as we age, we're going to all need kind of more help, but uh, as any good uh, individualistic American, we are reluctant to acknowledge or ask for that. But it's an area where, again, you know, you can hear pastors or parish ministers talking about when they decide to put in, like, assisted listening devices, you know, saying, okay, we're going to need 10. And within the month, they have a request for 30. You know, it's multiples beyond. Again, my own experience when I was a pastor in Winston-Salem, we built a handicap ramp. I thought it was going to serve a handful of parishioners. Again, I was surprised at all the elderly parishioners who were suddenly at Mass every single Sunday. And they said, oh, Father, you know, when it's drizzling outside, I, I just can't make those steps in the rain. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's the hidden <coughs> disability that, that also we're, we're so unaware of uh, in that way. And, and that are kind of, again, so often age-related uh, or with other chronic illnesses. Uh, and we don't realize how much people are just kind of drifting away because they themselves may not be as conscious uh, of the need. But again, I would highlight in a particular way, you know, it was a meeting I believe that Mary O'Mara had uh, one night uh, a couple of years back and Monsignor Insler was there and they with the others said, you know, we can do more on this, we can research this, get a better image about the church nationwide uh, and with Catholic Charities and the diocese and their kind of their leadership to say, let's pursue this. So uh, uh, it's gotten a lot of coverage in different areas, picked up by dioceses throughout the country. So it's a, a great gift that uh, from the Archdiocese of Washington has made to the larger church this week. I would just close on a note, which is a, a somewhat unfortunate, Kara has a new book out, just came out last month, Catholic Parishes of the 21st Century. And it's looking at all the data that we have collected and examining all the great massive changes that have occurred in Catholic parish life over the last 10, 20 years. 
Unfortunately, with this project, uh, we would have included a chapter on disabilities, uh, but the manuscript was due before the research was done. <laughs> uh, so it will be in the next one. Uh, but I remember commenting to the others that our timing was off here uh, because it would have been an excellent chapter to include in this book, looking at these different dimensions of Catholic parish life and the changes that are occurring. I just have a comment. Uh, thank you, Father Tom, and thank you, Kara, for their work. You know, um, I came in late to so a good little presentation, but I, I would suggest that um, what Kara has done for this community and for this issue is given us some basic facts and some basic understanding and some basic ability to move forward. Um, we are doing a lot in this diocese in a lot of ways, and it's always, frankly, the local leadership. It's not, it's not the Cardinal, frankly, though he's a very big supporter, and it's not just for me, kind of charities. And it's even not Mary and all the great work she does. It's really what happens in parishes and in schools when people say, you know, we've got a, a need, we've got a concern, we've got basically an opportunity, let's serve that. So uh, not to downplay the great work that anybody here does, but thank you for all of you who are in local situations and saying, um, we know for a fact we have an issue, a concern, a, an exclusion in our community that's not right and appropriate. And uh, Tom, thanks for bringing that out for us to see, and thanks for allowing us to use your great skills and care to make this a, not just a local issue, but an issue that's not still across the country. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think it's really Parishes have closed and the mal parishes have been amalgamated. Has that made any difference to the, to the overall findings? Uh, we did not look at that in relation to the disabilities question. Um, it, it, it would be helpful in one level in, in parts of the Northeast where most of the closings or Midwest are occurring, simply as they move to a new parish location or this is the center, that additional resources are available and the ability to make some of the accommodations. So there is a beneficial element on that end. The contrast is parish closings are a phenomenon of the Northeast and Midwest, really. The South and the West cannot keep up with the growth of the church. And because we're in this part of the country, we often are kind of unaware uh, of that reality. So places like the Diocese of Cleveland that we've worked with, in 20 years, 200,000 Catholics fewer in Cuyahoga County, the city of Cleveland. 200,000 empty pews, you know, seats in pews, schools all over, in one county. Uh, and, you know, they, they didn't disappear or stop going to church. They're going to church in Houston, in Atlanta, in Phoenix. Uh, and on the contrast, just recently we were talking with the Diocese of Fresno, uh, California, and they had on the opposite end of this that 20 years ago there were 300,000 Catholics, today they have 1.3 million. So in 20 years they added 1 million Catholics, 50,000 Catholics every single year, nonstop. The you know, clergy, the bishop, the pastoral leadership there, they're just trying to figure out what do we do? Everything has to change uh, to, to how to deal with this type of growth. Uh, and so you get the points of kind of opportunities. And so in some of those settings, those with disabilities might get lost out. Also many of them know they get a lot of extra attention because of just the sheer number and volume. So it's a real mix on the impact. Father, it sounds like you've answered your question then about why churches in the Northeast typically, or at least one of the contributing factors, is that as parishes diminish or as populations diminish, you can see the um, opportunity to welcome people to greater inclusion. Whereas when you're bursting at the seams, there are fewer opportunities to realize the differences between, between people, unless someone, uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? And, uh, and so uh, it, there's less opportunity to focus on, on uh, a, not a smaller portion of your population, but it seems like you serve quote unquote norm 
rather than than inclusion. Yeah. Very good observation. I'll have to remember this because <laughs> we know in the Northeast Midwest, it's also the Catholic population of parishes is getting older on average. You know, I had a comment from uh, at a meeting a few years back, a uh, bishop from the Northeast said, uh, church attendance is down. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, well, actually, Bishop, the data we have probably, I, I wager on it, is that church attendance in your diocese is probably up. The issue is you have so many fewer Catholics now. And they're getting older. And as you get older, you go to church more. You know, you get these other factors at play. You know, he's likely not at a 24% church attendance. He might be like at 28, 29, 30%. And the other bishop, you know, from the south, who says, we have no trouble with church attendance. You know, we have cars backed up down the street. You know, it's a traffic problem. And we're looking at the data there and saying, well, actually, bishop, your church attendance is low because people can't get into church. They're just by parking, you know, access that way. Uh, so yes, that, I hadn't thought of that, but there may be a piece of kind of that aging and responding and emerging might start to account for a little bit. Thank you. This is just a point of affirmation. Uh -huh. Formation on the efforts that we have done in the church to include this less privilege. And I would like to applause to you. May, we, uh, may this effort will continue so that more and more will be Yes, thank you. Many years ago when I was a young seminarian in uh, Chicago, uh, I worked with Misericordia Homes, which is a large complex serving the disabled with uh, this wonderful sister Rosemary Conley. Uh, but at that time, this is 1978, 1979, 1980, we were trying to work out how to do Sunday Mass and catechesis and sacraments with this population. And today it's just startling to me, it's a good piece, the extent to which efforts we were doing, uh, there wasn't much guidance. You know, or we were told, no, that can't be done. You know, at that point, about you know, receiving the Eucharist. And we're saying, well, yes, this can, and we're gonna take this step, and we're gonna take this step. And I think today it's almost comical because pastors, DREs will say, of course we're going to do that. And I'm thinking, 38 years ago, you know, uh, when I was in the seminary newly ordained, this was controversial. I mean, there, there really has been quite a, a shift in people's attitudes and understandings. Uh, I can remember at, at one point at Misericordia Homes, there were a large number, they had a hospital facility uh, of infants, young children, um, who were not going to live out their infancy. And the disabilities were so massive that simply as they grew, uh, they were going to die. And it was a point of, what do we do? Sister Rosemary kept saying, you know, what are we going to do? And so we started a program there that many of the children had been baptized in the hospital at birth. So there had been no public baptism. So there is a right in the church of accepting a child who has been baptized now into the church. And basically the whole baptismal right, except you're not baptized again. And we started doing that. So the families and brothers and sisters and relatives all come together and we're having a great party, like every other child doing that. The next question came as the children who were dying was the anointing of the sick and creating an effort there with the children and the anointing, bringing in their families, the parents and their siblings. And a part of that part of the, the church community acknowledging you know, that this little girl, this little boy, uh, was not going to live much longer. And, but the church is here, you know, in this community of saints together to pray and anoint this child. These are powerful, powerful moments. Um, and the, on your piece, the affirmation, this has now become much more common. Thank God. 
You know, it isn't extraordinary. It isn't somebody like myself thinking, you know, am I going to get a letter from Cardinal Cody, you know, <laughs> next week, <laughs> saying, you know, what have you done? Um, these are key. Uh, one story I would relate, we were doing this uh, so shortly after I was ordained, the anointing, and afterwards, Christopher, who was my servant, a young man with Down syndrome, he was assisting me through the, through the whole thing. And we're back in the sacristy, and I finished meeting the parents, and Christopher was putting things away. And as I came into the sacristy, Christopher was there, and um, he had the, the oil, and he had it open. And I said, Christopher, well, what are you doing? And he said, Father Tom, nobody prayed for you. So I knelt down at the sacristy, and Christopher came over, and he remembered what I did, and he put his hand on my hand. <laughs> I had been ordained only a month. <laughs> only a month. But let me tell you, you know, 37 years later, I still remember that moment and, and what it taught me as a priest. You know, in that sense of the sensitivity, you know, when St. Francis talks about accompaniment, you know, I can think of ways, oh, I'm going to go accompany you. I always remember, no, no, is it newly ordained priest? Who accompanied me was Christopher. And I think that that piece of kind of one of the roles or the invitations, ministry, the witness, the power. All right. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. We have a couple of copies of the report and the flyers on the book. So uh, the sign-in sheet Oops, for right the for the workshop is that still floating around? Just so we can. There we go. Has everyone had a chance to sign into that? If we could pass it back to Father Kevin. Okay. And a big thank you to to Father Tom. Uh, you just can't. He's Thank you. You're most welcome. Great.